Great, how you doing? We are in AP Psychology. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the history of psychology. And I know for a lot of you, you hear history and you're thinking, really? Uh, I didn't take a history class. Well, you got to learn a little bit about where we have come from to know how we got here and where we could potentially go in the future. Uh, and the other thing too, don't stress about all this history stuff because as we go through the year, a lot of this stuff will come back. For example, we talk about um, the, the very, very beginnings of psychology as a science. When we get to sensation and perception in the winter, we're going to see that again. We're going to come back to this stuff again. So this is just a really brief overview. The other thing I want you to know is that this complete first unit, the history and approaches to psychology and the different careers and things, is a 2 to 4 percent unit on the entire AP exam, which means that on the 100 multiple choice questions that you're going to answer in May, you will have anywhere from two to four questions about anything in this whole unit, not just this lecture, but in this whole unit. So don't stress out too much about this history. I'll try to make it as, as painless as I possibly can, um, and we'll just go from there. So as we look at the pre-scientific psychology and where we came from and how we um, got to where we are today, we do have our roots in philosophy. Now the philosophers were asking the big questions about, you know, our, the meaning of life, where did we come from, how did we get here, all the different philosophical issues that we, um, that we question ourselves with. Plato, not the stuff my kids play with, but Plato in 387 BC, he stated for the first time, the brain is the seat of our mental processes. Now, hopefully you're sitting there going, duh. Of course, the brain is, is where our mental processes take place. But this is 387, folks. No one had ever said that before. This was new stuff. So um, he was the first to say that, and we were able to progress from there. Aristotle. Aristotle, 335 BC. Uh, he came up with the idea that we are all born as a tabula rasa, which means blank slate. Now, if you think about what they wrote on, they wrote on slates. They wrote on tablets, okay? And, and they, Aristotle came up with the idea that all of us are born, it was a metaphor, but we're all born a blank slate. And who writes on us or what writes on us? Aristotle believed the environment. The environment writes on us. The experiences that we have determine who we become in the future. This is the very beginning of the behaviorist school of thought, okay? The behaviorists believe that our environment completely determines us. Rene Descartes uh, in 1637, so we're jumping way ahead here. We just went from the 300s BC to 1637 AD, and he came up with an idea called dualism. Now, the idea of dualism is the belief that the mind and the body are two separate entities, but they do work together. All right, they're interactive machines, Descartes called them. And he believes two types of ideas that are found in the human mind. The first type are innate ideas. And when things are innate, it means that they are there when we're born. We're, we're born with these things. The second type of idea that's in our mind are ideas that are derived or they've come from somewhere, from our experiences, okay, from our environment. So these two different types of ideas that we have in our minds, in that dualistic organism that we are, the mind and the body, interactive machines. John Locke, we're back to the tabula rasa idea. He, um, in 1690, came up with um, a more empiricist approach to all these different ideas about how the mind works, because that's where psychology started, is we just wanted to know how does the mind work, and then it evolved into the current uh, definition that we have today, but we're back to the blank slate idea that John Locke, he believed that all of our ideas come from some sort of an experience or a reflection that we have on some sort of an experience, things that we think about, um, that we're born again with nothing, tabula rasa, back to Aristotle, but we become who we are as a result of our experiences. Contemporary school of thought is behaviorism. Behaviorists go right back to John Locke and Aristotle back in the day, a long time ago. As we look here, I just have a slide for you that leads up to uh, Wilhelm Wundt, who's going to be on the next slide. But there's a number of things here that um, occurred in science that 
led up to the beginnings of what we know of as psychology today. In fact, we're going to study every single one of the things that you see here, okay? But this is from 1800 to 1879, the things that were going on that we still refer to now in psychology. Wilhelm Wundt is who we consider the father of psychology. A lot of people will argue with you and tell you that Freud is the father of psychology. The only thing that I would say is that Freud could be considered the father of modern psychology or modern psychotherapy as we know it today. But when we're talking about psychology as a science, Wilhelm Wundt is the man. All right, He doesn't get a whole lot of credit outside of the field of psychology in the sense of people don't even realize who he is if you haven't um, taken classes in psychology. So give the guy a little credit. I mean, he's got the beard going on. You know, cute little guy, I guess. But uh, he developed the first psychological laboratory in 1879. That's a date you should know, and this name that you should know, in Leipzig, Germany. And where in Leipzig, Germany, he was um, using something called introspective analysis. Now, introspection is looking within. When we look within ourselves, what uh, Wundt wanted his subjects to do was to um, learn to break down a conscious experience. Okay. And he trained these subjects for years on how to break down a conscious experience. Now, what's a conscious experience? You're having one right now. You're listening to my voice. You're looking at my goofy face. You are looking at the screen with the, the words and things on it. And you're trying to process all this information. You're trying to determine you know, what's important, what's not important. Um, you're thinking about other things like, why am I sitting here in front of the computer? I wish that she would do this in person. Whatever you're thinking about. And Wundt would have trained you, if you were one of his subjects, to break that little moment of consciousness down into its individual elements using this introspection. This is the beginning of the school of thought called structuralism. Now, if you're completely confused, that's okay, because it's very, very abstract. And structuralism, the way Wundt intended it, does not exist. Okay, We can't break down the elements of consciousness. It's not possible. Okay, It's not tangible. It, it cannot be studied. Wundt tried doing it using, like I mentioned, introspection. He used psychophysical measurements, uh, reaction times, things like that. And it just didn't give him anything. All right. Titchener is given credit for actually founding this school of thought called structuralism. All right, he was a student of Wundt. A lot of times you'll hear Wundt being the founder, but Titchener really is the one who came up with that actual term, structuralism. So structuralism in a nutshell, we analyze the mental contents of a um, moment in consciousness through introspection. We determine what those structures are of this mental process, and we find out how they are connected to each other. Moving on to William James, he's the first American psychologist, 1890. Um, he published his most famous work called The Principles of Psychology, and he is the founder of the next school of thought called Functionalism. He didn't believe that, like Wundt and Titchener did, that we can break down these experiences into their little elemental structures, okay? He emphasized the functions of a conscious experience instead of the structures of the conscious experience. They didn't go too far away from the root words to come up with their ideas or the, the names of their schools of thought. But this is just like structuralism in the sense that it doesn't exist. It's too abstract. It doesn't work. We can't do it. But it's where we began. Like I mentioned, James believed that our experiences cannot be broken down. Instead, he sees our experiences as a stream of consciousness. Okay, Have you ever done that stream of consciousness writing kind of a thing in your English class where you just kind of write and write and write and whatever comes out, comes out? Similarly, James believed that we can't just stop in the middle of a conscious experience. Our conscious experiences are ongoing and they continue to flow and they all work together. And so instead of breaking them apart, let's look at how they work together. Okay, let's look at what their purpose is and let's see how do these mental processes, how do they relate to behavior? And here we are, we're, we're up to our current definition of psychology, the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. 
and here you've got it. How do the mental processes and our behaviors, how do they work together? We didn't finish this definition here, okay? We did go back to psychology being simply the study of the mind, and then we end up putting the word behavior back in there later on, but we were going back and forth. He wanted, James, again, in the functionalist, in terms of looking at the relationship between our experiences and our behavior, they wanted to answer the question, how do these mental processes, these things we think about, the way our mind works, how do these things help us to adapt, survive, and flourish? Okay, so we're moving a little bit into the evolutionary approach. Okay, a little Darwinism. Last slide here, G. Stanley Hall. He may be uh, a relative of mine. I don't know. I married into the family, but I like the name. It's a good name. Um, he is the Wundt of the United States. Where Wundt created the first psychology lab in Germany, um, Hall developed the first psychology lab in the United States, 1883, at Johns Hopkins University. He also published the first American psychology journal. Now, a journal is simply a publication that uh, publishes research studies. Uh, and this, in this case, we're talking about research studies simply in psychology. Up to this point, 1887, we're only, be, we're only going to be reading about things in this journal uh, that have to do with the mind, structuralism and functionalism. And don't hurt yourself on this, but the first psychology journal was called the American Journal of Psychology. There you go. Very, very original. Finally, Hall was the first president of the American Psychological Association, which is still in existence today. I'm a member of it as a teacher affiliate. And um, the American Psychological Association is the most prestigious group of psychologists in, in America. All right. So hopefully I didn't bore you too much. Uh, went a little bit longer than I planned. But uh, have a great day. Have a great day. And I will see you soon.